was from the start of the trial. Locked me in a cell fucking naked all night. He's representing. He is making this up. I was never sworn That's in. So I'm from the 23rd. A lot of makeup, hair done, all that stuff, like a full nine. I want her to tell me to leave her alone. You know what? I told you to leave her alone. This is what I have left because of his greed. The defense of attempted murder. <laughs> His selfishness, his complete disregard of, and disrespect of others and life. <laughs> Number eight, Alan McCarty Jr. Alan McCarty Jr. of Milton was found guilty in August of threatening to take the life circuit judge Stasia Warren after she ruled against him in a child custody case. Still, I'm waiting for her to get there in the morning. I'm gonna pop a cap in that bitch. Bitch, cause you're stupid. Judges don't want to bring people to court. Yeah, there's about to be a crime that's going to happen if my kids don't come back to me, you stupid. Sir, what is going on? Who the you calling, sir, you stupid? Where's your judge warrant at? You going to bring that out? Yeah, I want to report a crime that's about to happen. What do you mean a crime that's about to happen? Four rooms. I got a gun pointed at your building. I'm letting you know I'm going to shoot this. You got to give me my kids. Playing handcuffs, and I'm going to. Execute that son of a right in the street. Communications, Warhurst. Where are you at, sir? I just told you I'm outside of her. Circuit Judge Matt Foxman said that McCarty also threatened a prosecutor's unborn child, prompting the crude convict to erupt in the courtroom. Foxman then ordered McCarty to be removed from the courtroom, but he kept yelling curses and racial slurs at the judge and an assistant state attorney. That's your bad finger. I didn't appreciate that. Take all my paperwork so you I can't show these people. You wanna take my kids from me and act like that? Win that warning in this court. Bring the camera back, he's making this up. Lock me in a cell naked all night. I have not been sworn in at all. You're a, You're a liar. liar. He was sworn in. No, I was not sworn in. Yes. I've never been sworn in. Um, um, my daddy owns the building and I'm a f***ing idiot, huh? Brought your dress today, you little f***ing prick. He's he is making this up. I was never sworn That's in. You want to take all my paperwork from me? On the road. It's not. Yes, sir. McCarty then spent the remainder of his sentencing hearing in another room where he watched the proceeding through one-way glass, the same location he spent much of his trial. The foul-mouthed Florida man, Alan McCarty, was sentenced to 20 years in prison and an additional 10 days for a series of expletive-laced outbursts that nearly led to his mouth being duct-taped shut in court. Number 7. Jacob Larson Clearly growing agitated, Jackson County Circuit Judge John McBain threw off his robe and helped tackle to the ground a defiant man during a hearing on a personal protection order violation. Taze his arse right now, the judge shouted as he rushed toward Jacob Larson, who had been talking back to the judge and blamed his alleged stalking behavior on the woman he was pursuing. The woman directed to me, all, all, all like. I have messages from October 9th after we got out of court, and then I have some from the 23rd. Hanging out at her place of employment, you put things all over her car, her managers have got to come in there and ask you to leave. A lot of makeup, hair done, all that stuff, like the full nine. She's instigating it though. Why do you feel that she's instigating it? Well, she's uh, posting pictures. McBain had ordered the man to spend three days in jail, a period that quickly jumped to 93 days as Larson continued to aggravate the judge during the December hearing. The resulting takedown was a rare instance of a judge using physical force, one Jackson County Chief Circuit Judge Thomas Wilson said was allowable. He said that a judge has the power to take whatever action is necessary to maintain order in the courtroom and noted circuit court judges have arresting powers. Taze his ass right now! I don't even know him, so I just don't understand how he's like so obsessed and like keeps messaging me. Call him. Stand up. Yeah. I want her to tell me to leave her alone. You know what? I told you to leave her alone. Put your hands behind your neck. Number 6. Smith Riley 
On November 16, 2013, Smith Riley was involved in an armed robbery in Norwood along with two other men. Portia Brooks and Aaron Martin were inside a parked car when Riley approached and knocked on a window with a handgun. According to court documents, Smith Riley forced Martin out of the passenger side, went through his pockets, and then shot him in the head, but Martin survived his injuries. He then leaned into the car and fired two shots at Brooks as she sat. She passed away three days later. Norwood Police Lieutenant Tom Fallon said in an interview that in addition to pleading guilty, Smith Riley also confessed to the crime. On the day of the proceedings, members of Brooks's and Martin's families addressed the court and asked him to deny Smith Riley's parole. Sharon Brooks brought Portia's ashes to court and said that Smith ruined her life. He not only slayed her, but he slayed Sharon as well, mentally and emotionally. She added that he slayed her identity as a mother of three, and because of him, they are left with nothing. Except the reality that she is fallen. This is what I have left because of his greed. But as you can see, I get nothing back. This is what I have left. I, I talk to her, I kiss her, I hold her. His selfishness, his complete disregard of, and disrespect of others and life. Portia's sister asked the judge to give Smith the maximum sentence. Smith Riley pleaded guilty on August 11, 2016, but decided to withdraw his plea against the advice of his attorneys. However, Hamilton County Common Pleas Judge Charles Kubicki rejected Smith Riley's change of heart and sentenced him to life in prison without possibility of parole. After receiving his sentence, Smith Riley collapsed to the floor of Kubicki's courtroom and the police had to pull Smith Riley to his feet. The defense of attempted murder <laughs> Number 5. Judge John C. Murphy On June 2, 2014, Brevard County Judge John Murphy and public defender Andrew Weinstock had an altercation. Weinstock did not want his client to waive the right to a trial and responded to the judge's question of, what do you want to do with, what do you want to do, I'm not waiving, you want to set it for trial, set it for trial. As Weinstock started to argue that the judge's position was an emergency created by the state, Murphy said that if he had a rock, he would throw it at him just then. After Murphy told Weinstock to sit down and Weinstock refused, Murphy asked him to come out if he wanted to fight and that he'll just beat his ass. What followed was not caught on camera as the two exited the courtroom. Sounds of the altercation were captured on the recording. Initial reports accused Murphy of punching Weinstock in the face. Blaze Tredis, a public defender for the 18th Judicial Court, stated that the attorney said that immediately upon entering the hallway, he was grabbed by the collar and began to be struck. They were then separated by Deputy Brian Griffin. Judge John C. Murphy was fired by the Florida Supreme Court judge for appalling behavior. The Supreme Court ruled that Murphy was not fit to serve as a judge after the confrontation with assistant public defender Andrew Weinstock. Number 4. Arthur Booth in 2015, Miami Judge Mindy Glazer and defendant Arthur Booth made headlines. Glazer had recognized Booth from their time together in middle school. She remembered him as a promising young kid who was great at math and science and had big goals of becoming a neurosurgeon. However, when Booth was 17 years old, he got into gambling which led to debt and depression. That led to addiction problems. By the time Booth walked into Judge Glazer's courtroom, he had already served time in prison and faced theft charges. In the courtroom, Booth broke down in tears and could barely look at the judge, admitting his embarrassment. Luckily, Glazer knew he had potential. He just needed to learn how to make better decisions for himself. Mr. Booth, I hope you were able to change your ways. Good luck to you. Oh my goodness. I'm sorry oh. to see you there. I always wondered what happened to you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Did you go to Nautilus for middle school? Oh my goodness. I used to play football with him, all the kids, and look what has happened. I'm so sorry. To oh me. my goodness. This is the nicest kid in middle school. Oh my goodness. He was the best kid in middle school. Glazer set bail at $43,000 or offered him one year in jail. She said she really hoped he would turn his life around as it really hurt her to see him there. She added that she had the best memories of him and it was up to him to change things. Ten months later, Booth was released from prison for good behavior. He had spent the last several months reading and learning about business, and he wasn't about to give up his shot at turning his life around. They say people can come into your life for a reason. 
No one believes that more than Arthur Booth, a man whose chance courtroom encounter with a former classmate forever changed his life. Number 3. Michael Madison Michael Madison was given capital punishment for the torture and slaying of 18-year-old Shirelda Terry, 28-year-old Shatisha Sheely, and 38-year-old Angela Deskins. In 2013, their mutilated bodies were found decomposing near where Madison lived. Madison was classified as a physical offender in 2002 when he was convicted of attempted physical torture. Madison's lawyers argued his behavior was created by his unmannerly and chaotic childhood, but the jury and judge were not swayed. Judge Nancy R. McDonnell, who has never issued the capital punishment in more than 20 years on the bench, said she was struck by the sheer inhumanity of what one human being can do to not one, but three human beings. During a sentencing hearing for Michael Madison, Van Terry took the stand to speak to the man who tortured and assassinated his 18-year-old daughter, Sherelda Terry. As he spoke and turned toward Madison, he grinned. Terry lunged across the room and lunged at the face of the man who had taken the life of his daughter, and rightly so. That was definitely one of the most dramatic moments one could witness in a courtroom. Number 2. Tanner Jacobson and Cody Howard Tanner Jacobson and Cody Howard only faced 30 days in jail for driving on suspended licenses when they decided to bolt from a Washington state courtroom in handcuffs and oversized orange shower sandals in 2018. It was those sandals that got the best of Howard. He fell on his face in the hallway outside the courtroom as Lewis County Judge Buzzard lowered his gavel and gave chase. Howard, 28, managed to get up as Jacobson sped by him, and they took a stairwell where they descended several flights. Judge Buzzard caught up with Howard and tackled him at the exit of the building, while Jacobson fled on foot for a few blocks before his sensibilities overcame his adrenaline-charged mind. Howard walked back to the court feeling sheepish. Deputies grabbed Jacobson, 25, a few blocks away. Cody Howard received six years in prison for his moment of insanity, while Jacobson received a year and a day. This courtroom escape is definitely theatrical because of the drama of the chase and apprehension. Number 1. Jacob Morgan In 2015, Morgan, then 17, started a fire at a Rock Hill, South Carolina mobile home that led to the demise of his 14-month-old stepbrother. Morgan pled guilty to involuntary slaughter, third-degree arson, and unlawful neglect of a child, according to York County court records. His mother said that all he ever wanted was a brother, and he got to enjoy his brother for 14 months, which is not long enough for any of them, but life's a tragedy. Mrs. Hill Dover and her husband Mike Hill, Morgan's stepfather and Joshua's father, had left Morgan to look after Joshua and said the 17-year-old was asleep when the fire started. Deputy Solicitor Willie Thompson said at a previous hearing that Morgan waited outside the home as it burned, didn't call for help or save his younger brother, all of which showed malice. Ultimately, Jacob admitted that he had never gone back to sleep, that he was playing with tea candles, and that he was lighting them up and had a fascination with fire. Although Morgan has autism, and its parents believe he was forced into admitting to starting the blaze. Jacob Morgan was sentenced for 15 years. He was also sentenced to 15 years for arson, however this was suspended to five years probation. At the hearing, Morgan broke down in tears and collapsed on the floor, as prosecutors spoke of the trailer park fire that ended Joshua's life. Morgan's lawyer said the teenager is a very gentle soul and will struggle behind bars, adding that the case was one of the hardest he had dealt with. That's all for today, folks. See you next time.